When I called Boris Johnson a liar, gosh, people were just outraged that I'd broken parliamentary protocol. More outraged at that than the fact that Boris Johnson was a consistent liar. Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Christian Giri Murphy, and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest this week was the third black woman to be elected as a Labour MP. She was the first black woman to speak at the dispatch box as a government minister. And she's just written a book called A Purposeful Life, which she started writing when she was recovering from cancer. Yet Dawn Butler is often attacked. If you, if you tweet about her, if you tweet about interviewing her, you'll get a load of responses back calling her a liar or somebody who makes things up. And her book is fascinating because it takes all of these things head on um, and is, is like a sort of a, a series of stories of aggressions and the way you've dealt with them. It's very fascinating, I think. Thanks for coming in. Ah, oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm going to actually begin at the end. Love because that. you're wearing lime green Love today, that. <laughs> and your, your chapter at the end of the book is called The Lime Green Suit. Explain the lime green suit. So the lime green suit is all of another story of me buying a lime green suit and walking into an event and just the look on everybody's faces like, what is she wearing? You know, how can she be wearing a lime green suit when we are a grey suited organisation? And I could just see all the cogs whirring in their heads. You know, it's like, oh my God, you know, she can't wear a lime green suit because we, our customers expect us to all be in grey suits. And it just made me think about how we need to disrupt the grey suited organisations. Not try to fit in. Not try to fit in. Is it an acceptance that you don't fit in? And, and that you spent a lot of time perhaps trying to. Yeah, I mean, in the beginning, there's been times when, I mean, I started my work in the city as a computer programmer. So I've got plenty of grey suits. And in the beginning, you do try to fit in. But the whole point is, I'm never going to fit in to an establishment that wasn't built for me, right? I'm never going to fit nicely into Parliament. It was built for why privileged men. So I'm always going to stand out. So if I'm going to stand out, stand out. So wh where does that leave you with politics? Because you, you, you're, you're now, you know, you're, you're almost at the stage where we can call you a veteran. I know, uh, shocking. <laughs> and, you know, you're, you're, you're one of the few people who did actually have some ministerial experience mm -hmm. in the last Labour government. Um, you were very close to Jeremy Corbyn. Mm -hmm. You're clearly not close to Keir Starmer and the current leadership, so you're kind of not in the top team. Mm -hmm. So so you don't fit in, mm -hmm. again. <laughs> again, story of my life. So, so where, where does that leave you, um, you know, a year away from an election in which people are expecting, you know, there's a good chance Labour will win and form the next mm -hmm. government? Well, the, the point not, is... Not trying to fit yeah. in, is that, is that where you are? I, I don't need to fit in. What I need to do is do the right thing. When I called... Boris Johnson a liar, gosh, people were just outraged that I'd broken parliamentary protocol. More outraged at that than the fact that Boris Johnson was a consistent liar. And I think without me knowing what I know, doing what I do in the way that I do it, we wouldn't have... We, we wouldn't make much progress, yeah. let's put it that way. Well, I mean, you've taken me to that instant, for which you're also now famous, mm. for, you know, for standing up in Parliament, referring to him as a liar and being told to withdraw mm. it or, or, or leave or be thrown mm. out. And, you know, mm. you're thrown out, you know, a few months before he is declared a liar. A liar. Um, and, is out of, and is out of politics. Um, so, that, I mean, let's talk about that. I mean, you know, a lot of people at the time thought, well, she's just attention-seeking. <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. If I was doing it just to seek attention, I would have been all over the airwaves. Everybody was calling me for an interview, but that wasn't the point. I did it because the conversation needed to happen and the conversation needed to start it. And I started that conversation. Eventually, people started saying, well, is he a liar? Has he been lying to us, the country, all the times that he's been stood at that dispatch box? And the answer was yes. What reactions from MPs did you get after that? Because there's well, that, the official reaction yes. where you are told off by the Deputy Speaker yeah. 
and thrown out. Thrown out. Yeah, which I was in part expecting. You knew it would yeah, I wasn't expecting to be thrown completely out of Parliament. <laughs> like I didn't know. I didn't actually know that I had to leave like the premises uh, immediately. I couldn't even go back to my office. Now that was a shock to me. I thought leaving the chamber, that's fine. Oh, you had to get off the estate completely. Off the estate completely, and they were like are you going to leave or do we have to escort you? I was like, gosh, good job I had my keys with me. Um, so that, you know, I wasn't expecting. But I wasn't expecting being shunned by uh, lots of MPs from my own party. I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't expecting for people to be embarrassed that I had broken parliamentary protocol as opposed to Boris Johnson lying. You know, I hadn't expected people to say to me, did I do it to embarrass the deputy speaker? I mean, that shocked me because I was like, hang on a minute. Can you guys not see that there's a problem with parliamentary systems that allows a liar to, to freely lie in the chamber? And the person who calls it out gets thrown out. Gets thrown out. Well, so, so there, were, there were lots of Labour MPs with that. I mean, were, were they sort of, I mean, I don't know whether you want, I don't know whether you've named names before or whether you want to. No, I haven't named names because... I haven't named names. I've named some names in the book. You know, I yeah. have spilt tea, as they like to say. So I have named some names. But no, but I do have the WhatsApp messages that I'm keeping for prosperity, maybe for that's, book number that's for two. The next book. <laughs> right. so, so what, what do you think that was about? I mean, was, was, is, this, is this a sort of a sign of the nervousness of Labour at the moment, that they don't want to look um, like they're not ready for government, like they're not no, grown-ups? I don't or, think so. I, because really, that was, they should have embraced it, right? Because I'm saving democracy because our democracy relies on truth right so if you have the head of our democracy if you have the prime minister that lies and we're just absorbing that and the public's absorbing that that is really dangerous for our democracy so i see myself uh, you know unapologetically as like a savior of democracy but at that time it wasn't about how close we were to power i think a part of it is about and i do reference it in the book like the messenger, I think if I was somebody else, if I was a grey suited person, the message would have been received differently. There would have been more protection. Now, the other thing that you've been famous for recently is your filming of the police when you were stopped. Mm. So, so just remind us what, what happened there um, for, for those people who perhaps don't remember. So on the 8th of August, I had called for Cressida Dick to resign. I'd done this article. Who was the Metropolitan Police Commissioner at the time. Right. Yeah. And I'd done this article, I think, in the Metro, and I'd called for her to resign. The very next day, on the 9th, I was in a car with my friend, who is still black, for those conspiracy theorists that like to say he was white. No, he's still black. We were driving along in Hackney at about five miles an hour as we were approaching the traffic lights, and we were surrounded by police cars with their blues and twos. And I can say we were surrounded. At the time, I just said we were stopped. And even that, people didn't believe. And when I said, when I said there was more than one car, the police denied it. It took me like almost two years of writing to the police and everything is in the book to get all that information. So every time they wrote back, they let a little bit of information go, a little bit of information slip. And then I'd latched onto that and expanded that information. And in the end, I got them to admit uh, that there were three police cars in the stop of me and my friend with their blues and twos going. Uh, and what happened was that they, they, they stopped you. And why did you start filming? Because I'd had this disagreement with Cressida Dick, the then commissioner, I was recording it for my records to say to her, see, there's a problem with black people driving whilst black. There's a problem just going about your ordinary day. But if you're a person of colour, you are going to get disproportionately stopped, whether you're walking on the street or whether you're in the car. And I thought, well, this is going to be fun evidence for her when she says that, you know, I'm imagining it or all of those people that call me a race baiter. I thought this is going to be interesting. And I started recording it. But what was interesting was all the mistakes, you know, the fact that the police officer, he was perfectly polite. I didn't have any problem, you know, with his attitude, his attitude, um, said that he put the registration number in the system and it came up with uh, with the same car but registered somewhere else or something. Completely in Yorkshire. In Yorkshire. Yes. I was like, so you can't be from Yorkshire and drive in 
in That's Hackney. Suspicious. It was ridiculous. And then the younger guy who I had a problem with his attitude, I had asked the police for his body-worn video footage and I was told he hasn't got any because his battery was flat. So all of this was taken years to tease out the police. Now, the thing is, you and I know the body-worn uh, video was implemented so that to protect the police, but also to protect the public. Now, if the simple override of that is you've got a flat battery, there's a problem there, right? Because if you're a rogue police officer, you can do whatever you like and you can say, oh, my battery is flat, so I didn't record it. So what we see is you challenging the police as they are asking you various questions that mm. you clearly felt were impertinent. Yeah, absolutely. They, they were impertinent and, and unnecessary. And it's like, and I still, still don't know to this day why we were stopped. Now, what, what happened almost immediately was you're, you're then sort of bombarded with social media abuse. Yeah. And you're accused of being a liar. Being like, yeah, which is a trigger for me. Do you, do you feel you've been accused of being a liar all your life? Is, is, that, is, that, what, is that what you mean when you say it's a trigger? Yeah, I feel that I'm always having to do that additional bit of explaining because people don't believe me. Because you're a black woman. Because I'm a black woman. You know, why did they not believe that I had said that we were, we were stopped in the car, me and my friend, who was a black male, that people insisted that they want a picture of him. He doesn't want his picture out there on social media. Just believe me, we were driving whilst black and the police stopped us for no reason whatsoever, and it happens all the time to black people. Believe it. Now, you, you said Cressida Dick was in denial. Uh -huh. um, she's gone. We now have a Metropolitan Police Commissioner who says he accepts all the criticisms of Metropolitan Police. Uh -huh. Racism, sexism, corruption, mm -hmm. homophobia, you name it. Um, but he rejects the institutional label. I don't want to get hung up on that I institutional know. argument. but um, He's disappointing, though. But that's as disappointing to you, is it? Yeah. Because, you see, I think that is very political. And I think he said that because of the Home Office. I don't think he said that because he truly believes that. Because if you believe, if you accept everything in the report, then you accept that the police is institutionally racist, institutionally homophobic, you know, and all the rest of it. But he doesn't want to say those words because we've got a current government that's trying to gaslight the whole nation to say that racism doesn't exist. And that's the problem. Because Suella Braverman rejects the idea of institutional racism. So, so what, you think it's not feasible for the Metropolitan Police Commissioner to say it's, it, he accepts that it's true? Yeah, I think he was lent on by, uh, by this government, by Suella Braverman. So that, that culture of, of, of senior officers or leaders rising to the defence of the majority of police, you don't think is right? Even it's, though the majority of police are good police? It's fundamentally wrong. And the good police officers want these rogue, racist, homophobic, misogynistic officers out. And every week we are reading about another police officer who's been found guilty of a heinous crime, whether it be rape, domestic violence, racism. Every week we're reading about this. And that, and that is because they are starting to expose them. I mean, the commissioner wants more power to be able to sack hundreds of officers. Yeah. Do you think he should be getting them. Yes, he should. And I think that there shouldn't be a delay in that. We're, we're all on board in him having those powers to get rid of rogue police officers. Why not? Because you have to have I a mean, process, don't you? You have to have a process that, absolutely. that is robust and but has an appeal and all that. It's ridiculous, of. right, that if a police officer fails uh, vetting, they can't be sacked. So what they, what they have to do is move that police officer into a desk job. So at the moment, the Met Police, at the, moment, the Met Commissioner has got hundreds of police officers who cannot be uh, public facing. I mean, you, you write about your first sort of interaction of, you know, with the, with the police where you sort of, you felt the racism, if uh -huh. you like, um, which was just after you got your first car. Yeah. I drove to a party, a guy, uh, uh, didn't like the fact that there was a party next to his house, came out through a brick through my car window and also slashed my car roof. And so I told my friend to go and get my brothers because 
that was the first thing. My brother said, whenever you're in, tr you're in trouble, just get a message to us. You know, we'll come. My brother came and this white guy tried to stab him. He had the knife in his hand and tried to stab my brother. Seeing this guy try to stab my brother, I'm thinking, oh my God, he's going to stab my brother. We need to do something. And I was like, call the police. We need to call the police. So somehow I called the police. The police came and arrested my brother, even though... This guy, a white guy, still had the knife in his hand. They arrested my brother and they had him in the back of the van. And I was just hysterical, like, but he's innocent and this guy still got the knife. And it was only when George Floyd happened that I asked my brother, do you remember that time? And he was like, sister, I remember it. I still have the scars. What do you think he meant by that? Did he mean mentally or...? He's got the physical scars physical as well. Physical scars as well. Yeah. So... Where the police had put the handcuffs on him, they drew blood. So he's got a scar where they drew blood from the handcuffs. And then he told me how they were kneeling on his neck, on his back. And as he was telling me, we were on the phone, as he was telling me, there was just like these silent tears coming down my face as the realisation that I could have lost my brother because I called the police. Let's go back to childhood then. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it's quite remarkable that you came out at 18 years old, as somebody who was confident enough to challenge the system. Mm. But it doesn't sound like school was, was great for you in terms of sort of... No. And I, and I learning think, <clears throat> and education and... No. I didn't, in, I didn't enjoy school. I didn't like school and I wanted to duck out of school um, if it wasn't for Mr Taylor, the one teacher. And that's why it only takes one good teacher in a classroom, in a, in a school full of um, problematic teachers. I remember I had a, a, my best friend, one of my best friends, Andrea, she was a white uh, girl, straight A student, right? And we used to have this competition where we would see who could write the smallest and the neatest. And so you do things like that when you're a teenager, right? And um, so our handwriting was basically identical. And I remember saying, let's swap homework. And so we swapped homework and I handed in hers. She handed in mine. She got an A. I got something like a C or something. I can't remember what I got. I only remember that that, that A was mine. But you, th you think that was just... Do you think it was racism or was it, or was it just preconceived ideas that you weren't an A student? I think it was a, a combination of, of all three. Uh, you know, it was the fact that, um, yeah, I wasn't a straight A student in their eyes. So my work isn't going to get an A. It was probably a combination of the fact that, you know, I was uh, a black student and quite outspoken. And so it's almost like putting you in your place. So why didn't you go to university? Because me and my friend decided that we would apply for some jobs, some sort of pretty well-paid jobs, and see if we would get it. And we thought, there's no way we're going to get these jobs. And I got the first job that I applied for. So I was like, well, let's go make some money. I was programming, like, we learnt... COBOL and C++ and uh, multimedia. Uh, so I was programming in those kind of languages. But that didn't last? No, because um, obviously it was a male-dominated industry. And I just got sexually harassed uh, every day at work uh, by one particular guy who just has an obsession with, like, making sexist comments and looking up my skirt. And so um, I wore trousers like every day for years just to stop that from happening. And in the end, when I got the opportunity to take redundancy, I just took redundancy. That, that takes us really to the question of intersectionality. Mm. Um, and I think what's unusual about, you know, what, what you're prepared to say is that, uh, you, you know, not everyone's an ally, it yeah. turns out, yeah. um, including a lot of women. White feminism is a real thing. What is white feminism? So white feminism is where the feminist movement does not look at the struggles of black and brown women. They don't look at the intersectionality of what we go through. So we will go through sexism because we're women. We will go through racism because we are black and brown. We should talk about your sort of your actual politics a bit then, <laughs> which is actually not a huge part of the book. Mm. I mean, you know, you, you sprinkle it in, interestingly, but this is much more sort of a personal story, I think, yeah. isn't it? Because my politics is about my life journey 
rather than studying politics or you will you will find and you know this that a lot of people in politics are very well connected they're a friend of a friend they're married to somebody they used to date somebody you know they that web is very well connected whereas that is not my political journey and i've come from a working background although it is now isn't it you're 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 well connected to sadiq khan Oh, but I'm a veteran and now. And you That's said why. you want to be a mayor of London. <laughs> I'm a veteran now. <laughs> Been around so for a now, while. Now you've got the network. <laughs> now I've got some connections. But, um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I came in with Sadiq in 2005. And, you know, we became friends. We became, we became friends because, you know, there was some stuff happening in Parliament that it, it was nice to have someone to confide in. So did you say to him... Look, can you just like shove off now? Because, I'm like, what's taking you so like long? <laughs> what's like taking <laughs> you so long? No, no, it's like when he's, you know, when he steps down, my hat will firmly be in the ring. So do you think this will be his last term? Oh, I don't, I don't know. I, do, I don't. You, I know. bet you do because you're his friend. But... <laughs> no, yeah. he doesn't. Tell, he doesn't tell me everything. Trust me, he doesn't. As an MP, you have also revealed some pretty shocking experiences mm. beyond the women's. Parliamentary Labour Party. Two famous ones are you in the lift, being mm. treated as a cleaner, mm. and you meeting David Heathcote Amory, senior Tory MP, who challenged your rights to be in a bit of Parliament. Just tell me briefly about those two incidents. So um, the lift incident was where I was going into committee, and there's a lift, and it's... It is a members only lift, but generally only for when the bell goes. And I got in the lift and I was, you know, I was preoccupied because I was thinking, what do I need to do? My committee. And there was this very loud conversation by the other MP saying that this lift really isn't for cleaners. And so it took a while for me to realise that they're talking about me. And so I had to sort of correct them. But I also, you know, can you imagine being a cleaner in that situation? So I had to say there's nothing wrong with being a cleaner and how rude and disrespectful that, that they were. But also I was an MP, um, elected. And so, you know, I've earned my right to be in this bloody lift. Um, and it who, was just, who were they? Why, why didn't you name and shame them? Because because so, Sadiq's got the names written on a piece of paper uh, tucked away from me. Because this is the other thing. There was there were so many incidences that you don't take them all on board. Like you, you kind of take some of them on board and you challenge some of them, but you're all so busy. Otherwise you spend your whole day fighting all the racist incidences. But when I told that story again, sort of a few years later, I got challenged by uh, the staffer of uh, Angela Smith, the one that called called somebody a funny tinge. They weren't white. And I got challenged by her husband who used to work for her to say I was lying trigger again right and had to call him out in the end he he apologized for that but it was like just because you hadn't experienced it as a white man you said if it doesn't mean that you've got the right to call me a liar and deny my lived experience and the David Heathcote Amory situation he physically tried to stop me going to the members part of the terrace he said where do you think you're going uh, this is for MPs only, and basically you can't you can't eat here. Afterwards, my team were very upset by that, and I was like, "Look, eat your lunch. After lunch, I'll have a word with him." And and I was expecting him to kind of apologise, right? So I was like, "Why do you think you could address me in that manner?" And he was like, "This place is going to wreck and ruins. They're letting anybody in nowadays." And I was like, "Who the hell are you?" Because I didn't know who he was. I've had that before, and I've had worse than that before, you know. But I thought I would just challenge him, just lightly, and I thought he'd apologise, and it would be the end of it. But he didn't. He 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 doubled down. So, on so it. what is your advice then to people who who are find themselves in that kind of situation? So the first thing I say is, like, if you're able to, because you're not always mentally able to Exhausted. challenge. Yeah. So, but if you're able to, and if you have that, if, you're, if you've got on a good day and you've got that mental capacity to challenge it, then challenge it. And you can do it in a number of ways. You know, you can just let them know how they've made you feel. You can say, 
what you said to me, I found really offensive. And I need you to know that this is how you've made me feel. And then you can, you know, walk away or you can challenge it like I did. Where is the lasting change? What is the vehicle for lasting change around all of these things? You know, it, is, is, is it increments? You know, is it you do your bit, I'll do my bit, and then maybe something will change one day down the line, or maybe things do change slowly? What is it? I, I mean, it, it, it's a consistent and concerted effort, but it's much quicker if there are many. It's much quicker if there's more than just one. If there are lots of us calling for change, if there's lots of us, you know, calling out the injustices then we will see change sooner. The Me Too movement, you know, George Floyd. If there's lots of us taking to the streets, if we can be each other's allies, we will see change so much quicker. You can use your privilege for good in so many different ways. And I just think that if we all did that, we would move the dial on the injustices in society and would have a more equitable society. But it takes each and every one of us to do that and to acknowledge our privilege. You know, there is white privilege. It's a fact. What is your answer then to the people who say, don't talk to me about white privilege when I am white and poor and, you know, deprived or discriminated against as well? Yes, you are all of those things. And we have to look at what we need to do to change that. This government, instead of addressing those things, they will try and turn the white working class, poorer people against immigrants, against people of colour, instead of, you know, us all working together because we have more in common. But it doesn't mean that you still don't have white privilege just because you are poorer and working class. So what is your privilege? If you are, if you are poor and white... Oh, what is your privilege? Your privilege presents yourself in many different ways. So if you're poor and white, you're probably walking down the street and you're not going to get stopped by the police because you're white skinned. But if you're poor and black and you're walking down the road, you're going to get stopped by the police. If you're poor and white, you could go for a job interview and you'd be seen in a certain way because of your whiteness. And that's, that's not something that... And it's not something to feel guilty about. Like some people say, oh, you're trying to make white people feel guilty. No, all it is about is just acknowledging the fact that you have white privilege. It's really that simple. You've written about having cancer, but this is not really a book about cancer, no. which it could have been. Um, how, how has that changed you, that whole experience? Yeah, you're never the same person after being diagnosed with cancer because when you hear those words you have cancer, often your first thought is you're going to die. Thinking about that kind of focuses the mind. And, and it was because my mind was so active, but I had a long operation and then I had a really serious infection. And so I was out of it for a while. I needed to do something with my active mind. And that's why I started writing. And if you could change the world in any way, how would you change it? So if there's one thing I could do, I would eradicate racism. I would eradicate sexism and eradicate homophobia. And I would eradicate all of those biases and discrimination that makes things so hard for people. That would be the change that I would, if I had a magic wand, do to change the world. Dawn Butler, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.